Hi, my name is Paul Goulart, and this talk is going to be about Clarabel.jl, which is a new convex optimization code written by my group in engineering science at the University of Oxford. So what does this package do? Well, it's a convex optimization code. It solves conic optimization problems in the form that you see written here, where we minimize some quadratic objective plus some linear term, subject to some constraints, some linear equality constraints, where S is restricted to be inside some convex cone. And the choice of cone that you put here dictates the class of problem that you're solving. We allow quite a general variety of cones. At the moment, we support uh, the zero cone, which gives you a quality constraint, the LP cone, the second order cone, and the semi-definite cone. And the only restriction on the problem data is that everything should be sparse and the matrix P should be positive, semi-definite, or even zero. And so that means that you can solve all of these standard problem forms just by defining the cone in the appropriate way. And you can also mix and match these cones so you could make, for example, a quadratically constrained uh, semi-definite program with a quadratic objective if you want. So before I go into the details, it's worth asking why we're doing any of this at all. Why do we need a new convex optimization code when there are already other solvers available? And really we had four motivations for doing that. The first is that we have what I think is a, a nice new method for solving convex optimization problems using interior point, which gives us a substantially reduced iteration count, but also cheaper iterations. The second is that we wanted a way of doing that uh, with a kind of rapid prototyping kind of environment. So Julia was made a lot of sense for us when we started. A lot of the best convex optimization codes are commercial. We wanted something that was liberally licensed and free. So this code is all Apache licensed. And finally, we wanted something that was really flexible and highly customizable so that we could try uh, to make custom solvers for particular problem classes. And so what we did was we took what we thought were the best design features of a bunch of other solvers that we were familiar with. And we basically tried to just steal all the good ideas from those codes. So we've taken ideas from uh, the Julia code Cosmo, which is a first order solver. We've taken ideas from CVX Opt and Ecos, which are two interior point solvers in Python and C. And we've taken some of the, the sort of high level design ideas from OOQP, which is a C++ uh, QP solver. So let me start by showing you how to get this package and how to use it. If you want to install it, it's very easy. You just do add Clarabelle in the Julia um, package manager, or you can download it directly from GitHub here. And that's all under our Oxford Control uh, group page, where you can also find other um, related convex optimization codes. And if you go to the GitHub page, you'll also find a link to our documentation, which looks like this. And you will find there much uh, more detailed summary of how to use the solver, a couple of example problems, how to implement new linear solvers, how to call it through different interfaces, and so on. You'll also see this rather stylish cow logo. So I'll very quickly now just show you how to solve this problem in the native interface that we provide. It's relatively straightforward, and I'm going to do it by solving this example problem, which is also on our documentation page. So the first thing to do is to just import the package, and then make a settings object and a solver object for yourself. And on the documentation for the project, you'll see all of the different settings that are available to you. And then once you've done that, what you want to do is you want to take this problem and you want to put it into standard form for the solver. And the standard form is what appears on the right hand side here. And what I want to do is to just construct all of these pieces one at a time. Everything should be in sparse format. So the first thing I'm going to do is to make a P matrix and a Q vector that agree with this format. And the only sort of strange thing there is that two there is just offsetting the one half right there. So you make these two objects, now you have your objective function. Then we need to make our constraints, so I need to turn these two constraints into something that looks like this red line here. And so I need to make, first of all, the equality constraint, so that's the first line here, which is x1 minus 2x2 is equal to zero, that's the zero there. And then I have this two-sided constraint, so I need to turn it into a collection of one-sided constraints with a one on the right-hand side. And this is just standard convex optimization remodeling stuff. And the final thing I need to do is I need to specify the cone constraints. Well, the first constraint, because I, I modeled this one first, is an equality constraint. So I say I have a zero cone of dimension one, and then I have four inequality constraints, so I say I have a non-negative cone 
of dimension four. And the solver will let you mix and match or use as many different cones as you want. So I could, for example, say I have two non-negative cones of dimension two each. It doesn't make any difference to the solver if you do that, but the point is you can construct this cones object to have as many different cones of mixed variety as you like. And then finally, I just need to populate my model and solve, and it will give me the answer. And the output that I see is something like this, which looks like the output of every other interior point solver. You'll get some information about the dimensions of your problem, and you'll see the progress as the iterates uh, progress, and you'll see the primal and dual residuals converging to zero, and ultimately it tells you that it solved the problem um, with some output status. So that's all fine, but it's a little bit annoying to do it that way. So better to use um, jump because the solver supports the mathopt interface in Julia. And in jump, it's very easy and quite standard. You say you want to use Clarabelle and jump. You construct your jump model in the usual way. Then you define your variables and constraints in the usual way, and you just say optimize. And you will get exactly the same answer as you did through the native interface. It's just all a little bit easier to do. If you don't like jump, you can use convex.jl instead, and the process there is similar, just with slightly different syntax. So you construct your problem with your objective function here, and then you construct your constraints, and then you say solve, and you tell it you would like to see what is the progress of the solver. And the Convex JL interface and the jump interface, they will produce the same answer for you, but they will produce it in two different ways. And the reason for that gets at um, what's special about the way we implemented the solver. So I want to show you the output from the two. And on the left, you see the native interface or jump. It's the same output. And you see here, there's only six iterations, whereas for convex.jl, there are 11. And why did that happen? Well, the reason why it happened was because in the native interface, it's kept P in its native form in the objective function. So I have two non-zeros in P, and I have six non-zeros in my constraints, whereas in convex.jl, it's removed P from the objective function, and it's reformulated it into a problem with a linear objective and more constraints. So that's why I have 17 non-zeros in A, and I also have a couple of second-order cone constraints. And the, the thing that's nice about the way we've implemented the solver is that it doesn't have to do this. You can keep the objective function natively in your problem, and you can keep this smaller footprint problem here, and the solver will solve much faster if you do that. So I will, in the next few slides, explain to you um, what I mean by that and um, how we implemented uh, the solver to preserve that quadratic term in the objective. So I'll start here by showing you first how uh, a common interior point algorithm is implemented for a problem of the type that we want to solve. And then once I've done that, I'll show you how our method differs. We can start with the primal problem that I had on the first few slides, which is to minimize this quadratic function subject to this equality constraint, and then S living in some kind of mixed convex cone. And the first thing I can do is to write down the dual of that problem, which is to maximize some similar looking quadratic function subject to its own dual equality constraint, and then a constraint that the dual variable Z should live inside some other cone, which is the dual cone of K. Now, a, a common interior point approach, not ours, but a common one, is to first rewrite this problem so that P is equal to zero. And you can either do that by just assuming that P is equal to zero, or if it's not, you can put a scalar upper bound on this quadratic term, and then minimize the upper bound plus the linear term. And then that constraint that that quadratic term should be upper bounded by a scalar is a quadratic inequality constraint, which you can rewrite as a second order cone constraint. And then once you've done that, then following on, you rewrite the whole problem as what's known as a homogeneous self-dual embedding. So I'll show you how that homogeneous self-dual embedding works, because ours is based on that, related to that, but a bit different. So the first thing we do is we just get rid of all of those P terms. And if we have to, we reformulate the problem a little bit to put those objective terms into the constraint. And then what we do is we put them both together and we rewrite it as a feasibility problem. So we say I want to minimize zero subject to the primal equality condition, the dual equality condition, and then this one further condition which says that the duality gap, the difference between the primal and the dual cost, should be zero. And then I have all of my conic constraints still. Now the problem with this is that 
it may not be the case that I can solve this problem at all. There may be no feasible point because the primal problem or the dual problem may themselves be infeasible. So I can fix it up a little bit by adding two additional scalar variables. I have this variable tau here, this non-negative scalar, which multiplies b from the primal constraints. And I have the same tau multiplying c from the dual constraints. And then I have one further scalar variable, kappa, which goes to the right-hand side of my zero-gap condition. And now I have a problem that turns out to always be feasible here. And it's feasible either because I can actually solve the problems that I started with, or if the problems that I started with are infeasible, I can set tau equals zero, and I can end up constructing a certificate of infeasibility for these problems. And so what I end up with is this problem shown at the top, and that is called the homogeneous self-dual embedding. And it's a really attractive problem form to try to solve these conic optimization problems with. One, because it's always feasible. One, because it's the dual of itself. If I were to form the dual of this feasibility problem, I would get the same problem back. And if I find any feasible point for these constraints here, then if I scale that feasible point, it remains a solution to my problem. Now, once I have a feasible point for this set of conditions, I can just look at tau and kappa. And if I find that tau is positive and kappa is zero, then from that, I can construct a solution to my original problem. On the other hand, if I find that tau is zero and kappa is positive, then I can construct an infeasibility certificate, a proof that my original problem cannot be solved. So that's the standard homogeneous self-dual embedding. That is not what we do. We do something a bit different. So what's different about our approach relative to this standard self-dual embedding that I've shown you? The difference is that we try to keep p in the objective function all the way through rather than getting rid of it. And so let me just show you all of the same steps, but just keeping that p term where it wants to live. So I have my primal problem and my dual problem as before, but previously I said that we would typically drop these terms and reformulate them as constraints. Now I'm just going to not do that. And I'm gonna go through the whole procedure again but I'm just gonna see what happens if I let that stay there. So the first thing to do is to rewrite my problem as my two problems as one joint feasibility problem. So I have minimize zero subject to my primal equality condition, my dual equality condition, which now has this additional linear term Px in it, and this zero duality gap condition, which now is looking a little bit awkward because I have this linear term on the left, but then on the right-hand side of the equality, I have this quadratic condition. And then I have my constraint on my cone variables. So if I could solve that, I would have a solution to the two problems again. And again, I have the same problem as before, which is that if this problem has no feasible point, or this problem may have no feasible point because my primal or my dual problem may be infeasible. So just like before, I can fix it up by adding some additional variables, this variable tau and this variable kappa here and rescale all of the problem data in my problem. And when I do that, what happens is that I end up with this term px on the left, which is fine, it's just an additional linear term, but I have this really difficult one over tau x squared term on the right. But I'm not gonna let myself be deterred by that, I'm just gonna press on with that problem formulation and see what happens. So, if I do that, then it turns out that's still a homogeneous embedding of my problem. And it's still the case that this problem is always feasible, whether or not the problem I started with is feasible. It's not the dual of itself anymore, but that turns out not to matter. It doesn't make any difference if the problem is self-dual. What matters is that it's a homogeneous embedding. And if I have any feasible point for this problem, then I can scale that feasible point and it stays a feasible point or a solution to this feasibility problem. And just like before, I have the same condition on tau and kappa. Once I find a feasible point for this system of equations, if tau is positive and kappa is zero, my problem is solved. If tau is zero and kappa is positive, I can construct a certificate of infeasibility for my problem. Great. So I want to solve that using an interior point method. And having written down my problem like this, from there forward, my approach is more or less the same as other interior point algorithms. I just am trying to solve a different set of equations. An interior point method is basically a kind of variant of Newton's method. I'm trying to solve always some set of nonlinear conditions. And 
I'm just solving a different set of nonlinear conditions now with that difficult looking x squared over tau term. The, implement, the method that we've implemented is, is very similar to uh, CVX opt or ECOS. It takes our KKT conditions at every interior point iteration and condenses them down to an indefinite uh, symmetric form. And we solve that using a direct LDL factorization to get our step direction. We use a Maratra-like uh, corrector strategy. We use nesterov todd scaling, just like CVX, op, CVX opt and ECOS. And before we solve the problem, we apply a kind of equilibration or balancing procedure to scale our problem data just to give us a little bit better conditioning. And that strategy is taken more or less directly from Cosmo or OSQP or SCS. So we're implementing a really standard looking interior point algorithm. We're just solving a different set of equations at every iteration. And without going too much into the details, I want to show you why it should be the case that that should be so much faster. And it comes down to the linear system that you have to solve at every step. So underneath any interior point code, you have the solution of some set of equations, which is trying to compute some kind of Newton-like step direction. And if you have a linear cost in the homogeneous self-dual embedding, you get a set of equations that looks like this. You have your A matrix from your constraints, and you have some matrix here, which is formed from your current iterate. And this is some symmetric indefinite system to solve. If you have a quadratic cost and you turn the quadratic cost into a constraint by reformulating it with some kind of epigraphical upper bound, then what you have to do to get it into second order cone form is to factor P. So perhaps you take the Koleski factor of the matrix P. And you then put that into the constraints. So now I have more constraints. If P were something other than a diagonal matrix, this factor of P may have some uh, fill-in in it. And then I have to factor this whole matrix again. And this can be really expensive. Whereas the way we've approached it is we've kept P in our objective function. And where does it appear? Well, it just appears again on the left-hand side. And we have different right-hand side to solve with. But the system of equations that we're solving is not any bigger than it would be if we were solving a problem with a linear objective. And we don't mess up the sparsity of our problem because P remains in its original form in the corner. So this, prob this system is smaller, it's sparser, and it also turns out to require uh, fewer iterations with each one of those iterations being cheaper than before. I won't say anything further about the algorithm that we've implemented for our interior point solver. We will hopefully have a paper about that coming out uh, fairly soon. Instead, what I would like to do is to show you some of the design choices that we made when structuring and writing this software, because we've borrowed heavily from several other packages. So our goal throughout was to make the code as modular as possible at all levels. And so I will show you, first of all, how we did that at the top level. So we have an interior point solver that operates on a collection of data objects, but the solver itself doesn't really care what the problem data is it doesn't really care what the variables look like or how many variables there are and so on. It just facilitates the interaction between these objects. So every interior point solver has somewhere some kind of KKT system to solve. It computes some kind of residual and it has variables in some form. And then it has some kind of result. So the interior point algorithm that we've implemented just operates on high level objects of these abstract types. And it's up to the user to provide concrete implementations of all of these types. Now, we have provided an implementation for that problem that I've been showing you throughout, and that's called the default implementation, but others are possible. So we might, for example, want to develop our own customized solver for an optimal control problem or a support vector machine problem, and those have particular problem features that may make it faster to operate them on, to operate on them in some customized way. And so to do that, we could just make different subtypes of these abstract types and then implement some kind of custom behavior. And this follows very much the design philosophy of the uh, C++ OOQP solver from Madison, where they, de they defined a bunch of abstract classes and then just defined the interaction between the classes. And we thought that was a really nice way of thinking about how to design a solver at the high level. For our default implementation, we have um, 
a KKT system that we need to solve for our particular problem structure. And there we've layered it in three different layers. So at the top level, we're trying to solve a system of equations that has our X variable, our S variable, our tau and our kappa, our Z problem data in a very particular form. And we need to solve this system of equations. But the way we do that, and the way most solvers do that, is by partly condensing the problem into a into a slightly nicer, more compact form. So we've chosen to condense it down to a symmetric indefinite system of equations, and that's this middle KKT solver layer, but we could have condensed it further to get a positive semi-definite system, or we may have decided to solve the original system as a non-symmetric system. So we have that middle layer, or we may want to put a, an indirect solver there. And then underneath that, we have in the end a linear system of equations to solve, for us, it's uh, uh, an indefinite symmetric system, and so we solve that using a QDLDL, which is a, a Julia-based LDL solver, or we can use MKL, or we can use Cholmod, or we can use something else that the user specifies. And it's very easy to drop in a new linear solver there. It's only a few lines. And it would be straightforward to add other indirect methods condensing GPU solves and so on. So that's the middle layer, and then at the lowest level, we're even able to implement a solver that operates on other data types. So if you, when defining your problem, just specify to the solver that you want it to be a solver with arbitrary precision arithmetic using the native big float style, then you just say your solver is big float, your settings are big float, and then you define all of your problem data in that format, and then the solver will just work. And the only caveat is that your linear solver also needs to support that data type, but QDLDL being a native Julia solver, it does that. And then you can solve your problem as before. You get exactly the same answer as I had on the previous slide. The only difference is that now the data type is big float. Now, finally, what I'd like to do is to show you a little bit about the numerical performance of this solver, particularly with respect to QPs, because the situation where you have a quadratic objective is where it really um, shines, I think. So what we've done is we've solved every problem in the Maros Mazaros QP dataset for each of four different solvers. One is ours, one is Gorobi, which is a commercial solver, Ecos is an open source interior point solver, and Mosaic is again a commercial solver. And for each problem we solve with each one of these solvers and we ask which one was the best, and the best one gets for that problem a performance ratio of one, and all of the other solvers get a performance ratio which is the multiple of their solve time with respect to the best. And then we plot this profile where this point here, where we have a ratio of problems of 0.4 and a performance ratio of 1, that says that for the red one, for 40% of the problems it was the fastest. And then if we look, say here, where the performance ratio was 2, that says for 70% of the problems it was within a factor of 2 of the best. And so ideally what you would like is for your solver to go right up the side and then along the top, but of course that isn't possible. Different problems will have different solvers that perform the best. But what you would like is to at least be up and to the left. And you can see that our implementation is actually above the others most of the way up until you get to the last few problems which are really, really nasty to solve. None of the solvers are actually able to solve all of these problems because they're so difficult, but we were at least able to solve something like 85% of the problems. And then what we can do also is plot the actual computation time for this collection of problems and then sort it according to the computation time in our own and we get something that looks a bit like that. So you see that our solver is generally faster, at least uh, in a kind of overall way, to each of the others with just a small number of problems where we failed and I think probably fewer that we failed um, than the others. Possibly Garobi solved a few more but overall we did pretty well and we're pretty fast. And this is all just using native Julia code and native Julia um, LDL solver. Everything here is single-threaded, including um, Garobi. Okay, finally, what is next for this solver? So we've released it. It's currently version 0 0.1, and uh, shortly we will be releasing another version, which I didn't have time to release prior to videoing this talk, that supports exponential and geometric cones. That's likely to be version 0 0.2. And on the side, we've been developing a Rust language port for this package for use on embedded systems. Actually, this whole project was initially just meant to be a prototype for this Rust implementation, but in the end it was so nice working with Julia we decided to release it as its own package and we will continue to support it as its own package. And beyond that, we'll start to add additional KKT solve methods for STPs, uh, because we think there's quite a lot more that can be done there, and we will start to populate this 
uh, flexible abstract data type structure that I described with different customizations for different optimization problems, uh, particularly starting with optimal control and probably SVM. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening, and we're very happy to answer questions uh, either by email or on our GitHub page, and we encourage you all to give this all over a try and let us know what you think. Thank you.